At Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we believe that technology is the catalyst that will empower a low carbon economy. But in order to apply IT at scale, we need a more efficient model. By enabling our customers to consume their IT as a service with HPE GreenLake, they lower costs while also reducing energy, carbon use, and e-waste. Our customers can realize a 30% cost of ownership savings while reducing energy by 33%. Sustainability and savings. Now that's smart business. This is code red. Acting now is a question of climate justice and we have the solutions. If we take bold and decisive steps towards a net zero global economy by 2050, we can keep within 1.5 degrees. But even then, we still have to contend with violent climate disruption. We need massively scaled up investment in adaptation and resilience. This is absolutely critical for those at the front lines of the climate crisis. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Frances Steed Sellers, a senior writer here at the Washington Post. Our program today is part of the Protecting Our Planet series, and it comes as the climate crisis takes center stage in the lead up to the COP26 talks in Glasgow in November. My guest today is Amina J. Mohammed. She's the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. A very warm welcome to Washington Post Live. Great to be with you. I'd like to start right away with those important talks coming up in November. What's at stake? What specific actions do you hope world leaders will take? And what's the cost if those steps are not taken? There's a lot at stake. For, for every COP that we have, um, there is a breaking moment. And for Glasgow, this is about lives. It's about livelihoods. Um, it's really about having a breakthrough um, on the Paris Agreement to make sure that we keep um, with with 1.5 degrees. And so that journey to COP less than a month away, um, what we will be looking to see are all those ingredients to a package that are needed for us to come out to say, yes, the world is on track um, to meeting the Paris commitments. And they will have to do with trade, they will have to do with finance, they will have to do with NDCs at each and every country, national determined contributions um, that will meet the ambitions of working towards um, net zero. Um, so a lot at stake, um, and I, I can't say enough, as you've seen with all the programs most recently, there really is a red alert. Uh, we picked a fight with nature, it's fighting back, and we've got to make peace. And making peace is that Paris Agreement and the key elements to it are those that have been discussed in the General Assembly at the UN that uh, passed last week, and those that we will see being discussed in Paris. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, the finance aspect that you just mentioned. Um, rich countries pledged one billion by 2020 to help less wealthy nations uh, reduce emissions. Many of those targets are not being met. Uh, what can the UN do and what should be done to make sure that some of those targets are met or other ones are put in place? Well, the 100 billion every year by, by this time now is, is long overdue and it hasn't been met. Uh, the meetings that leaders came to uh, convene by the Secretary General last week managed to get a little more on the table. The United States put $11.4 billion uh, on the table. That's to the 100 billion. It's not the 100 billion that is going to uh, be the investments that are needed for climate action. We are going to need trillions, but it is the handshake to say the world is going to be serious about this and the rich world, uh, the world that actually has had most to do with uh, putting a burden of uh, climate 
um, the climate crisis on the shoulders of the most vulnerable. Um, so what the UN will continue to do is to advocate for those resources to come annually, um, to provide and convene the spaces for others to, to move and uh, to, to crowd in more finance that countries can leverage. Uh, the private sector will be one um, sector that one will look at. Um, but essentially, this is going to be about our rich countries stepping up and providing the finances that are needed for adaptation, that are needed to make the transitions on energy, on connectivity, on food systems. Um, uh, the, the, the list goes on to what we can do, huge opportunities. But right now we need leadership to step up and put, as they say, your money where your mouth is. <laughs> um, Deputy Secretary General, we've been hearing from listeners and readers, and I have a question I'd like to read to you that comes to us from William Miller in Kentucky, who says, what can the UN do to motivate countries to work more diligently on the sustainable development goals, especially as it pertains to the climate crisis? Well, we, we have the framing for, for the sustainable development goals, and I think that makes sense to everyone at four years and everyone engaged. What we have not to do is to separate um, the actions that are needed from climate um, and the sustainable development goals. Um, uh, our goal 13, um, for a climate is, is very well integrated into that framework. So what we try to do with the footprint we have around the world and over 131 countries is to help countries get those pipelines together of investments in off-grid power, um, in food systems and the way in which we transform them. Um, and and to, to put those investments that will give greener jobs, um, where will address blue economies, um, and uh, will make sure that women and young people are at the center of this. All of that requires the means of implementation, be it financing or technology. And so our convening around these issues and bringing to the table those that can uh, make uh, can make the leapfrogging that we need today uh, at the scale and with the urgency is, is some of what we do. Um, it's. It's important for us to, to give the implications of inaction. We're already seeing it with lives lost and livelihoods and property with these intense um, climate events that we get. Um, I see it myself when I go home to Nigeria, um, where Lake Chad itself, a lack of investment um, in that region has uh, exacerbated the conflicts that are there, has put women and young people at risk uh, with, with, a, with a sense of no hope for the future. Um, and, and I think that if we could see a restoration project, a stabilization project, we put money into agriculture, into fisheries, um, into power off grid, we would see, um, you know, return of those societies and more peace. Um, so I think there are many ways in which we can motivate, just depending on the context that we find ourselves in, islands or, or, or landlocked countries alike. So you're, you're speaking a lot about underrepresented voices. And of course, um, the pandemic delayed COP26 by a year. There have been acti activists calling for further postponement, arguing that the vaccine and quarantine requirements will further disadvantage countries that are underrepresented anyway. Do you think that's a real concern? And if so, what should be done about it? I know that the British government has taken some steps, but are you concerned as this meeting is pending? We must listen to all voices and there are legitimate concerns around uh, the restrictions because of the pandemic. And we have to remember where restrictions are in place and we need to make sure we protect people um, that we are we are very responsible to that. Um, having said that, these concerns have been brought to the British government. We work with them. Um, many of those um, uh, barriers that were there have been taken down. There are still more issues that we have to discuss. But, you know, just as the pandemic came in and we kept people working and children in school using technology, um, so where we don't actually make it on the day, um, I'm sure that we will try to make sure that there is as much inclusion as possible, particularly from those stakeholders outside of the government negotiations. Um, when we finish those negotiations at COP, we have to come back to country and work with stakeholders. So they are the most important constituency and they need to be involved. Um, it, it is, as I say, tough, but we are, um, we're are we trying to work towards bringing down as many of those um, hurdles that they will have to, to cross to get to COP26. Uh, postponement? I, I don't think so. I think, you know, the postponing a, such an important discussion like this, it does mean that we put more lives at risk, that we don't come to agreement um, and that, uh, you know, we don't take seriously enough what needs to be there. I, I think that we will have the representation, voices will be heard and the negotiations will be inclusive. Well, voices are certainly making themselves heard in the streets, um, in protests. There are activists saying that, 
leaders talk a good game, but don't do enough. Do you think there's truth to those sorts of allegations? Absolutely, I do. <laughs> um, I do. I, I think that we promised Paris six years ago and we haven't delivered. So, of course, leaders have been talking what they're not delivering. And we have to keep the promise of the SDGs. We have to keep the promise of Paris. And, and this is why uh, COP26 and Glasgow is so important. There are many expectations on the 100 billion, um, on the 1.5 degrees, on the end to coal that the SG has been um, uh, has been advocating for. And, and I think that, um, you know, there's, the proof is going to be in the eating of the pudding, and that's going to be 26, COP26 in Glasgow. Let's see what we have to deliver on the table. There were good signs at the General Assembly last week um, when we saw uh, commitments made to end the financing of coal, when we saw more money on the table for 100 billion. Still a lot more to do um, and less uh, than 40 days to go before COP26. You've mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, of course, um, the 17 of them. And I'd just like to dig a little deeper. Do you feel you're on track to meet them by 2030? Look, just before the pandemic started, we launched the decade. We were not on track. And so COVID has further exacerbated that. However, having said that, there is a silver lining in the cloud. Many of the things that we have we thought to do before the pandemic, um, closing the digital divide, uh, uh, the transition on, on power um, to, to solar power, off-grid, those things have become a reality now. And so in the response uh, to the pandemic and its recovery, there's opportunity. But again, we have to put this back on the table of leaders of rich countries, where resources are. Are we able to free up sufficient resources um, for the scale and the urgency with which we need to invest in all these opportunities? If we don't, then we risk keeping the promise of the SDGs. We have